Thanks for listening to the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry, here to help educate, motivate, and put you on the right path to take control of your health through weekly discussions on topics in the medical field, public health arena, and in your community. And now your host, Dr. Barry. And welcome to another episode of the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. I'm your host, Dr. Barry Pierre, your favorite board-certified attorney, founder of drbarrypierre.com, as well as the CEO of Pierre Medical Consultant, helping you empower yourself with better health with the number one podcast for patient advocacy, affirmation, and education. This week, we bring you an amazing episode on colon cancer. Why? Because if you're listening to this on the day the episode drops, it is Colon Cancer Awareness Month. And guys, I'll, I'll be honest. It has been so difficult to get a gastroenterologist to come on to talk to us about colon cancer, really just gastroenterology things related, right? We were able to knock it out the park with uh, Dr. Andrew Berry. He's a resident, um, he, so he's almost finished, but I got one who is finished, finito, and I think I knocked this out the park, right? So I have Dr. Austin Chang, who is a triple board certified, dual IV lead educated and trained gastroenterologist. He's an advanced endoscopist who currently serves as an assistant professor in medicine, director of endoscopic bariatric program, and the chief medical chief medical social media officer for Jefferson Health. Guys, so not only did I get get a gastroenterologist to talk to us about colon cancer, I got one who is in love with social media, right? Who understands uh, the importance of empowering patients with accurate medical information while he's online, guys. And he has an MPH as well, too, right? So I mean, this is like the perfect person to have on the show and guys let me tell you like I didn't want to waste the opportunity so we talk about colon cancer on this episode we talk about what his uh what has been his pursuits and his uh tips and tricks as far as getting people to do colonoscopies and of course I had to end the show and ask him like why does he think social media is important again if you know um, I'm a big proponent of physicians being online to really try to combat all of this negative and really incorrect information that is out there as regards our healthcare is concerned. So I'm, he's a champion of it. He actually has an or his own organization as well that he's a president of. And I'm going to talk about that. So you got to stick around towards the end of the show to kind of listen and hear about, you know, how, especially if my physician colleagues who are listening, how you can be involved and kind of get uh, in the thick of things, especially when it comes to social media and healthcare. So uh, with further ado, Get ready for another amazing episode here on the Lunch and Learn with Dr. Barry. And like always, remember to subscribe to the episode. Leave us a five-star review, especially if you're on Apple Podcasts or if you're one of my YouTube watchers. Uh, leave us a review as well. And let's get ready. Talk to you guys later. Bye. One of the sponsors for the Lunch and Learn Community Podcast is the Lunch and Learn Community Store, where you can find t-shirts, sweatshirts, coffee mugs, stickers, and wristbands with the motto, Empower Yourself for Better Health. Remember, 50% of all proceeds will go to the Five Star Scholarship Foundation, where we give out college scholarships to deserving high school seniors across the country. Thus far, we have given out over 20 deserving scholarships to students across the country. So again, 50% of the proceeds will be uh, blessed to the Five Star Scholarship Foundation. And today you can get the coupon code LUNCH20. You can get 20% off your purchase and you support these high school students across the country. Again, the Lunch and Learn Community Store is at shop.drbearpierre.com and the coupon code is LUNCH20. All right, Lunch and Learn Community, um, you, and you just heard the introduction. Uh, and this is a topic that we've kind of touched on, we've kind of brushed on, whether, especially if you uh, watch uh, the Empower Yourself Red Hill series or you've read some of the blog posts, we've talked about uh, the importance of colon cancer. And of course, uh, if you're you know one of my Die Hunt Lunch Learn listeners and you're listening to this at the time that this episode releases, uh, you know this is Colon Cancer Awareness Month, right? So you know what better uh, opportunity and time to re-educate the Lunch Learn community, especially uh, those who are on my podcast listeners, on such an important topic then in the month where everyone's talking about colon cancer awareness. And I thought, yeah, you know what? I could talk about colon cancer, right? But I don't think I would do it much justice, right? So I say, you know what, let me get someone who like, that's what they do, right? Like that's their specialty. When we talk about colon cancer and cancer of the gut and gut health and everything kind of in from digestion to anus, right? Like, let me get someone like, that's what they do here, right? And and that's why I'm so thankful, right, for uh, Dr. Austin for coming in to the show and, you know, blessing us uh, here on the Lynch Learning Community. Dr. Austin, thank you. Oh, I said, it's it, 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 interesting, right? Because 
uh, most of the physicians would come on. I always just kind of say Dr. Austin or Dr. Whatever their first name is, right? We prefer Dr. Austin, Dr. Chang. Let me know how, how, how we should be addressing you here on the Oh, no, Dr. Austin is fine. <laughs> All right. I love it. I love it. So, Dr. Austin, again, thank you for coming on uh, to the Lunch and Learn. Uh, you know, we are truly um, – just for introduction, right? You know, in case someone doesn't know who you are, right? Give them a little introduction on who you are. I said I read the bio, but I got a lot of people who skip a right past my introduction. They do it on purpose, right? Because they want to get to the main uh, meat of the episode, right? Tell sure. them who you are. Yeah, so I am a gastroenterologist by training, and um, my area of focus within that is interventional or advanced endoscopy, and maybe we'll get into that a little bit later. But it's more sort of complex procedures um, within gastroenterology as well as weight loss procedures um, in the field as well. And my secondary interest um, is uh, regarding healthcare and social media, which I know we'll get into a little later on. Um, and so right now I am an assistant professor of medicine at Jefferson Health in Philadelphia. I also lead the social media effort um, for the institution as the chief medical social media officer, and I lead the weight loss endoscopy program there. And, uh, and yeah, I'm sure we'll get, you'll get to know me a little bit more throughout the interview. <laughs> no, de- definitely excited. I wish I could mean, I was telling them right before we kind of press record, um, you know, I was looking for a gastroenterologist. I wanted to talk about colon cancer, uh, but as I'm doing my deep dive, I'm reading his bio, I'm on his website, I'm on his YouTube page and I'm like, Whoa, like, you know, he like, yes, he's a gastroenterologist, you know, it was, it was actually triple boarded, not even double boarded, triple boarded. Um, but like he is one who like I've been screaming for, right? He's one of these physicians who understands that the power of his voice, right, uh, can't be contained in the office, right? Like it has to be spread out here in the land of what we call social media, uh, especially with all of the information that's out there, some good, some not so good, right? So again, I was uh, very excited. And like I said, we are going to kind of touch uh, uh, based on, you know, just like his importance of uh, social media and, you know, you know, and of course he's MPH, right? Because of course, why, why wouldn't he be an MPH, right? You guys know my <laughs> preference for the folks who has an MPH, right? So definitely appreciate, uh, you know, you coming on to the show. Uh, so Dr. Austin, tell us, you know, for those who may not know what a gastroenterologist is, right? When, when a person, you know, in particular say, yeah, you know what? I need to go see one. Like, oh. and, and it's so funny. I know in a hospital setting, sometimes like I, I won't even say gastroenterologist. I'll say like stomach, like for some reason, I'll just shorten it because I think the word sometimes, uh, you know, it kind of frightens people a little bit. Yeah. The word is a really long word. And I think that you're right. A lot of people don't recognize what a gastroenterologist does or what it means, So the word itself, gastro means stomach, and entero sort of stands for intestine. So anything related to the gut, really. But, you know, that term is a little bit of a misnomer because we also have to remember that the gut includes the esophagus um, and other organs within the abdomen, like the liver, the pancreas. These are all things that fall within our purview. Um, So anything related to these issues, which really is a very broad subject, and you'll see that Right now, as time goes on, um, we're becoming more and more specialized because we're understanding every aspect of the gut about each of these organs so much more that it's becoming too much for just a general gastroenterologist to handle a lot of the time. Um, And so we have to uh, often specialize even further than that. And and that's so true, especially when, you know, I have people, I have, you know, colleagues who, you know, they, they just do the intestines. I have colleagues who just does uh, deliver a colleague just like, so it, it's definitely interesting that even when you subspecialize, right, um, you can even subspecialize after the subspecialty, right? So, I, which is, you know, I think as physicians, we're always learning and uh, you know, you know, expanding our knowledge. So it's very interesting that, you know, we have people who are really becoming really honed in on, you know, really particular organ systems because uh, it's so, the, the knowledge out there is so vast that they actually have to. Totally. I mean, we treat things from anything from acid reflux all the way to bleeding in the gut to cancers all throughout the gut. And interestingly, my role as an advanced endoscopist most often I'm treating complications of cancer. So complications of esophageal cancer, of pancreatic cancer, I help diagnose and treat complications of that, of colon cancer. Um, so all of these, you know, there's so much. And now, like I said, um, my other area is in weight loss and obesity. So it's really expanded into all different fields. 
I love it. And, you know, and speaking, of course, of the, you know, the, 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 the main party at head, right? Again, we are, it's this March and, you know, this is colon cancer awareness month and colon cancer is just one of those, uh, no one wants cancer whatsoever. Right. And so when you, when you hear about colon cancer, right. And you hear about, you know, the, the, the instances of people who get it, people who die from it. Right. Like what is that in general? Right. So again, we know the intestines, right. But for the learning community listeners, like what does colon cancer uh, entail and what does that mean? And, um, you know, when, when, why is it so important that we have to, you know, celebrate a whole month to be aware of it? Yeah, colon cancer is one of the most common cancers um, out there. And, you know, it's actually one of the only preventable types where we actually screen ahead of time. So that's why it's really important that we understand what it is. And when we think about the gut, there's the small bowel. We have 20 feet of small bowel in our, in our belly. And then after that, there's the large intestine, which is also known as the colon. And, um, and so here, sometimes there are preventable types of colon cancer that start off as little polyps or growths in the, in the colon. And if we detect, it, detect them early enough, we can actually remove it and prevent cancer from happening altogether. And that's interesting, especially when you talk about the fact that we can prevent it, right? Because, um, you know, a lot of times, especially when we talk about prevention, you know, as an internist, um, did outpatient medicine, everything is, you know, prevention, prevention, right? Whether it's, it's eating right, whether it's taking your blood pressure medications, diabetes, like all these things is to try to prevent uh, the end organ stuff. And when, when I think when people hear like, hey, you know what, there's cancers out there that um, if we do what we need to do, right, in terms of getting screening, uh, we can actually prevent it. Um, I think that's such a, a huge deal that I think that you would think would get people kind of rushing, uh, you know, the, the door to do. Uh, but like you said, it's one of the most common cancers out there. So even though we have a cancer that we know can be screened for, um, clearly not a lot of people are getting screened. Right? Like who are the type of people uh, who should be getting screened and, you know, when should they even be getting screened for, uh, you know, the, the listeners out there? But yeah, you're totally right. You know, we set a goal as an entire field uh, to try to get 80% um, by 2018. And that actually, we didn't actually end up meeting that goal, which is really kind of concerning. Because like I said, it's a preventable type of cancer. And yet, we can't get the entire um, uh, recommended pool of people to get screened. So the way we go about screening this, and I think we'll get into the tools that we use, but we start recommending screening typically at age 50 is what most um, of our professional societies recommend. There are some societies that recommend screening a little bit earlier. So this is definitely a changing topic and evolving landscape. So the American Cancer Society currently recommends starting screening at age 45. And many of the other gastroenterology um, societies also recommend um, if uh, people of African American race also start screening at age 45 because of a higher risk in the, in that category. So um, it does vary, but generally speaking, most people with average risk and average risk meaning, you know, if, without any um, significant family history of colon cancer, starting at 50. Um, but there are isolated uh, situations that you need to start cancer, colon cancer screening earlier. So I think. At the end of the day, it's important to ask your doctor when it's appropriate for you. And that's interesting, especially because of the, the fact that you, you have these different societies that are saying like, hey, you know, maybe we should catch them a little bit early, especially obviously, uh, you know, me being African-American, you know, that's uh, I get, uh, you know, I get more heightened when I hear that there's some cancer that for some reason they should check on me a little bit earlier than kind of the recommended standard population. Now, is, is it because uh, just kind of in our community, it, it, it affects us more or, you know, you know, we get caught at late. Like why, why is it, why are some of these ages starting to shift down? Is that, is that really because they're trying to get more people uh, caught before that, I guess that 80% threshold? Yeah. It's um you know, just from all the studies that have been done, some studies have revealed that people with different risk factors, be it race or other sort of genetic um, risk factors can develop these cancers earlier. So, that's why it's offered to certain pop groups in the population earlier as well. Um, you know, whenever these screening recommendations come out, um, the, these big organizations and, and agencies have to take into consideration what resources we have. 
and whether or not it's going to overburden our health system if we recommend screening everybody out there because you know every time we expand it by a couple of years um, you know if we drop the age from 50 to 45 that's several million people there that we have to make sure we're able to accommodate so um, they have to take that into account as well and see if it's you know truly worth recommending for everyone and plus we also have to rec remember that sometimes there can be um, screening procedures that lead to uh, false positives and um, and sometimes that could drive you know a rare number of people down a path of treatment when they actually didn't need it so you know we have to take keep that in mind and make sure that we're recommending um, you know the right type of person and right category of people to to get screened and, and I know you kind of you kind of alluded to it. And I think we should definitely should touch on it now, right? When when you know someone says like, okay, hey, Doctor Austin, I'm here. I'm in your office, right? I'm ready to be screened for colon cancer. Um, you know, what are some of the ways people can actually be screened? Like, is 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 that part of the reason why we're not necessarily hitting that eighty percent threshold? Like, like what 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 options are there to get screened for colon cancer in the first place? Yeah. There are a variety of options that are currently um, sort of recommended by the official agencies out there. And um, the most uh, common um, and most preferred screening method is colonoscopy. So it is actually a procedure that we recommend. Um, and there are other tests like certain types of scans and stool tests that can be done to also potentially detect um, colon cancer. Now, there are a couple disadvantages to the non-invasive method, methods because um, you know those methods don't allow us to remove polyps on the spot and if you can imagine some of these stool tests might not actually pick up a cancer until it's already turned into a cancer and we need to remember the whole idea of trying to prevent cancer from developing in the first place and if we can spot an early polyp or an early growth we can remove that and at, at a much earlier stage. And I love that you touched on that because I know uh, when I did outpatient medicine, even now when I do inpatient medicine in the hospital, um, we know a lot of times when I ask like, hey, have you had your colonoscopy yet? Um, I get a crazy look, right? Because uh, one, um, it is a, and again, you, you have better experience than me, right? Two things that seem to hold people up from wanting to do colonoscopy. One, they, they talk about the solution, right? Like they, they, that's like, that's all they know. It's like, oh my God, I'm not drinking that stuff. Right. That usually holds. Them. And then two, just really the act of the colonoscopy. Right. They don't want something stuck up their butt. Right. And those two things seem to hold a lot of people back, unfortunately, uh, from getting the colonoscopy. Uh, but you said there's these these other options, but you kind of laid down some of the, the risks and issues associated with those in terms of the fact that uh, they may not pick it up soon enough to. Because, again, w would you rather pick up the polyp that's non cancerous or have a, a non-invasive test that said, hey, you got cancer, right? Like, I think that's uh, uh, something that, you know, it, it's difficult, but like sometimes you almost have to lay it out to your patients that way. It's like, say, hey, these, these are the options that are out there. Like, y yes, you can take that stool test in the comfort of your home. But the question is, and, and I always ask them, like, okay, if you take that stool test and let's say it does come back positive, like, are, aren't you, aren't you going to have to get a colonoscopy anyways? Like, so, I, like, I would just rather... <laughs> skip, <it> skip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and you know this might all change in the future we might have a good enough non-invasive test out there um but we're not quite there yet and you know we're trying to also improve on how we prepare for colonoscopy so the solution that you're talking about now there are solutions that are sort of based off of gatorade and so they taste a lot better you don't taste the it doesn't taste like ocean water anymore um, and there's also, you know, um, uh, things that we can do to make people more comfortable during the procedure so that, um, you know, so that it's a little more tolerable. <laughs> I, I love it. And let's learn community listeners. I hope you, you heard that. Right. So when, if you're your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, grandma, grandpa are trying to like say, I don't want you, you have to, you really have to give these reasons. Like, no, it doesn't taste bad anymore. No, they f make you feel much more comfortable. Like, you kind of have to give these positive, you know, reinforcements to to encourage, uh, you know, your relatives, right? Especially because a lot of our listeners 
kind of fall between the ranges of about, you know, 25 to like 40, right? So they're, they're kind of early, but unfortunately they, all of their parents, their grandparents, their aunt, their, like their, their relatives are right in the thick of things, right? So they have to be the number one advocate to say like, Hey, you know what? I just heard Dr. Austin say like, there's almost no more excuses not to get that colonoscopy. Like it, it kind of tastes like Gatorade, right? Like, you know, it doesn't taste bad, right? The, the, the test isn't as awful as you may think it is. Um, how long is the test? Like, especially when we talk about the colonoscopy, how, how long is that procedure? Yeah, it can vary, you know, it, it usually it can be rather quick, you know, maybe even like 10, 15 minutes. I mean, obviously the longer, sometimes we, we want to take our time and really make sure we're examining every, every nook and cranny there. Um, but you know, if we find, if we find something like a polyp and we have to remove it, that's obviously going to add time. So it can be a little bit longer than that. Now, most of the time really spent at the, at the clinic or the hospital, wherever you're getting this done is spent, um, just waiting beforehand, getting prepared and you know, getting positioned and all of that recovering the actual procedure itself really isn't that long. And, and I love that you said that because a lot of times, you know, especially when my patients are going for like surgery or stuff like that, you know, that's always the number one question. How long is this? How long is this? And I say like an hour, maybe two, right? Whereas, you know, the colonoscopy, again, this may be, you know, 15 minutes, 30 minutes. Guys, you guys, you guys are watching hour long shows uh, that, that, that will finish that like this colonoscopy is going to finish before your hour long show is going to finish, right? So, so now you can't even be like time. Uh, is a reason uh, why you can't do this colonoscopy. Now, question: Are people um, a, a, awake, asleep? Like, what's their what's their like kind of status while they're doing their procedure? Yeah, um, we typically, I think, it, the practice varies across the country depending on where you are. Um, but for the most part, we offer some sort of sedation, and sometimes, you know, depending on the resources and the staff there that are available. Um, there's sort of lighter twilight sedation versus a little heavier. And it also depends on the patient's risk factors, like if there's um, heart disease or lung disease or something that we want to make sure and be, you know, have control over or the anesthesiologist needs to have control over. Um, and then they may recommend something like general anesthesia for this. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, I'm, cause I got a, when I told people I'm going to be talking to a gastroenterologist about colon cancer, uh, the amount of questions I got regarding the colonoscopy, like, you know, they don't even, they're like, yeah, okay, I, that's great about the, the colon cancer and all, but like, yeah, tell me about this colonoscopy. Like, they, <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's such a rate limiting, it's, it's funny that that's, you know, one of the rate limiting steps, um, you know, in, in trying to, to battle, right, to try to get, you know, get over that, you know, that 80% threshold that the, the procedure in of itself and really uh, preconceived notions. Uh, so, so it's not even like actual truthful, you know, issues associated with this, the procedure. It's like their preconceived notion uh, seems to, you know, stop, you know, people you know, before it tracks. Um, like how, how do you, like how the patients you come in contact with, and of course, obviously like as a neurologist, I know you've done plenty of colonoscopies. Um, like how do you get your patients to like, like just jump right in. So, all right, doc, let, let's go. Well, doctor, I said, I'm ready to go. Let, let's get this colonoscopy. My 50th birthday is coming up. Put me down there. <laughs> I think you're right. I think that there's a lot of misconceptions about, about the procedure. And obviously if they're able to even just come in and speak with me, that's the, that's the most important step because that can clarify and reassure and, um, and sort of sort these out. I think that What's really helped a lot of people, honestly, even before coming in to see me, is the fact that some celebrities have even documented their their journey through getting a colonoscopy publicly. You know, Katie Couric, um, more, most recently uh, Jimmy Kimmel and Will Smith have done that. And I think it's really great that they've put themselves out there to show that, you know, it's really not that big of a deal. Um, you know, we can get this done comfortably and quickly. And, and I think that people think that, uh, you know, the process of getting prepared can be a little messy, but the actual procedure itself, you know, once everything is clean is, is really not that bad. And, um, and of course, at the end of the day, we want to weigh the risks and the benefits of doing this procedure. And the benefit is you can potentially prevent cancer from happening altogether. 
I love it. And, and Lunch Learning Community, um, you know, he's he's definitely going to list the, his information as far as links, especially towards the, at the end of the show, you know how we do it. Um, but Dr. Austin has a great video just kind of talking about, you know, Will Smith's journey, like especially you guys, I'm not sure if you guys, I'm, I'm assuming you do, right, follow Will Smith. But like, again, he actually chronicalized him getting the colonoscopy. And uh, Dr. Austin did a great video on his YouTube page. So I definitely want to make sure, um, you know, that that link will be in the show notes. To make sure you can watch that video because again it's 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 interesting and once a celebrity does it you know people are a little bit more okay with doing it right like it, it the, i think the the cloud uh, you know is, is removed the shadows are gone and all of a sudden it's hey well you know will smith can do a colonoscopy <laughs> like sure surely i can do a, a colonoscopy as well <laughs> exactly <laughs> So um, just to kind of wrap up on the colon cancer, right? Because so I, so I can read, because I really want to talk about the social media stuff, right? <laughs> wrap it up on this colon cancer. So we have, you know, one of the, uh, unfortunately, on one hand, uh, an extremely preventable cancer um, that, you know, we're, we're, we're not necessarily winning the battle just yet. Um, but it is also one of the most, um, you know, uh, you know, frequent number of cancers as well, right? And I, I love that we do have a full month stop, right? Like, of course, mo- in March, a lot of things happen in March, right? But uh, colon cancer is such a big thing from, from an awareness standpoint. And, and again, uh, lunch learning listeners, you know, even if you don't fit the age, right? Uh, I know your mom does. I know your dad does. I know your grandma. Great. I know you have family members who fit the age who should be getting this colonoscopy done, right? So, you know, please uh, reach out and get in touch with your uh, gastroenterologist uh, as soon as possible, right? Because again, you, and, for, and I'll tell you, as a hospitalist, the amount of patients that I see come in uh, with, you know, abdominal pain, constipation, diarrhea, that I unfortunately have to let them know, hey, you have colon cancer, right? It's so sad, right? Because I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, if someone like, you know, Dr. Barry would have been there, 10 years ago, right? And Dr. Austin would have been there 10 years ago and they would have listened to a video or they, they would have watched a video. They would have listened to a podcast and say, get your colonoscopy. Maybe this person in front of me doesn't have colon cancer. Um, it, it like, it breaks my heart, right? Because again, it is one of those things where like, ah, oh, you could have just got the colonoscopy. Like we wouldn't even be uh, unfortunately having this discussion. So again, I want to def- definitely thank you uh, for really highlighting such an important topic uh, that that is colon cancer again. Thank you for that. For sure, yeah. So now that, that now that we got colon cancer, you know, tucked in out of the way, uh, Doctor Austin, please tell me right um, your thoughts on social media and health education, right? And again, and and here I am. I'm talking on a podcast that's going to go on you, like, and so you kind of already know where I, I stand on the side of the fence, right? But like, tell me your thoughts on it, right? And 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 let, let's let's get to that. Yeah, I mean, chances are, if you're listening to this podcast, you know, you are here to learn, to be exposed to medical knowledge. And, and that's the whole thing is that, you know, there's a lot of information out there, like you said, some of it is really good, but there's a lot of it that can be really bad. And I think that we, my belief is that we need more health professionals who are trained to talk about these topics, to be present uh, on podcasts, on social media to be that voice of accurate information. And what I love about, you know, that, just that, that, that feeling, that talk that you're, you're going, cause I remember, I remember when I was a medical, I was a medical student and I remember being a medical student when I started, you know, blogging a little bit. Right. Cause, cause I was like, you know what, like, you know, I, I gotta like get this information out here. Right. Cause if I know it, um, and, and again, I might be a medical student, or maybe I don't know it, but I just kind of learned it. Um, I already know the general population does not. And so I remember being in uh, every semester, uh, my a dean of my college would, you know, they'd, they'd email me to say, hey, Dr. Pierre, come to the office. Um, or at the time was a medical student, Pierre, right? And they'd be like, hey, just want to let you know, we know you got a blog out there. You know, just remember some of the stuff you can't say, some of the stuff you can't do. So it was such a taboo thing uh, to even get out there, right, and talk medical related stuff. As a, and again, I wasn't a profession. I was still a student at the time. Uh, but the amount of eyes that I used to have on me um, that would say like, hey, just make sure, you know, you don't say nothing crazy or you don't do <laughs> nothing crazy or you don't, you know, you don't, you don't embarrass us or say something worse. Uh, it was very interesting. So I, I love that this new dynamic that I'm seeing now that people are like, no, 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 no. We need more 
experts, right? And that's really what we are, right? And I think, again, um, I think a lot of times physicians, and I tell my physician colleagues all the time, like, guys, you are health-related experts, right? Like, please go out there and, like, you know, kill some of this madness that I'm seeing online and on Facebook and on Twitter and all these places here because, you know, fortunately, the general population is believing it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think that, you know, we need to be out there putting out good information. And you're right, the dynamic has totally changed. And now it seems like it's a little more encouraged. I think that there's still some resistance, but, um, you know, it's becoming more accepted. And it's, to me, it, it's such a disconnect that, you know, those of us going through medical training, um, working in medicine are often told that, you know, um, we feel that our jobs are really just in-person encounters, but at the same time, you know, we kind of have an obligation to uh, to meet our patients where they're getting their information, and and um, and if we're not, then other people are going to be putting out information that isn't vetted, that isn't um, necessarily accurate or put in the right context. And I'll, I'll be honest, like with especially with me, the. The, the only, because I ended up getting uh, my um, master's of public health at the same time as my medical degree. And I remember a lot of my professors, uh, he, he was very big on that, right? He was very big on like, hey, you got to get out of the office. This one-on-one talking does absolutely nothing. Like, yes, you can treat this person that's in front of you, right? But like, you got to understand there's a whole community behind that person that needs that teaching as well. So you're, he, he, he felt like I was almost doing a disservice to the community if I only focus uh, on this one person in front of me, right? So I, I, I definitely like to use that, you know, that, that backpacking knowledge of the, the, the public health uh, to really say like, no, 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 like it's not just a one-to-one thing. Like this is a community-wide event that needs to be, you know, addressed uh, when we're talking about blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, colon cancer, like anything. Like I, I, that's, that's, again, I was, that's kind of why we're here today. Right. Because I said, you know, I can't just talk about this and just talk to my patient one on one. Like I have to let the whole world know. Right. Like and who's ever in the earshot, whoever's in eye shot, like, hey, like this is a topic that's important. I promise you it's important. And guess what? I got an expert that says it's important, too. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that one of the most telling things is when I come across a patient of mine who, you know, has an idea of what my job is like and the conditions that I treat. And, you know, like, you're right, I talk about colon cancer a lot. And, but really, a lot of what I deal with, like I said, is pancreas or bile duct related. And, you know, I think that having a greater understanding of those areas, I think can really change how people think about my field, can change the type of people, the young aspiring doctors to understand more about what I do and potentially join my field. And, you know, we all, all we're always looking for talent. And, um, and so I think that, you know, by putting ourselves out there, it can also just change our perception of what we do and what medicine is actually like. And what, what, what has been your drive, right? Like, cause obviously, you know, there's that public health aspect of why, you know, physicians in general, right. Mm-hmm. Should get out there. Right. But like, what's, what, what's kind of motivated you to like, and, and when I say you are out there, you're out there. Right. So like, what's, what's like, what's been your push? Like, again, I've never heard of a person who was a chief of social media or I'm like, Whoa, like I didn't even know that was a position. Right. So like, what's been like that push? Yeah. A lot of it really is centered on that misinformation piece of everything, but it's also thinking about how, there's been a growing distrust in the medical profession. And I think part of it is because, you know, at least for myself, when, when, before I entered this whole medical training journey, I used to sort of think of doctors as being really serious and stuffy and robotic almost. But if we can kind of, you know, if we can put, put ourselves out there and show that, you know, we're just like everyone else, we have the same interests and the same struggles and, and put that out there I think we can relate a little bit better. Our patients can relate to us more. And I certainly, the patients who follow me on social media, I think really enjoy following my journey or following what I do on a day-to-day and and what my life is like. And um, I think that it it just builds a greater amount of trust if we use it right. I think that there are a lot of ways we could use it inappropriately too, but, um, but I think that that's where we can also, you know, aside from, preventing misinformation or combating misinformation is to uh to humanize our field 
And, and I love that human aspect because um, there are people who, who follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and, and it, it, before, right, they used to almost be shocked, right? Like I, I could tell you my journey was, especially on, depending on the platform, my journey was kind of backwards, right? Where uh, when I was on social media, yes, I was Dr. Barry Pierre, but like, like you really just saw more of the human side, right? Like, yeah, I'm talking about the Lakers. I'm talking about this. Like, I'll, it was just, so I had to like slowly like let people know, like, no, no, no. Like, I'm actually like physician, like internist, smart guy. Like, I'm I'm kind of smart too. Um, and, and bringing that medical side, and it was very interesting to see people reaction. Like, oh, okay, all right. I didn't know. I didn't know you did this as well because they were so used to seeing that opposite side. And you're so right. I see a lot, especially, you know, of course I follow a lot of physicians as well. And sometimes I, I see that like, yeah, I see a lot of them are on that one side of the pendulum where it's, you know, medical education, education, education. I'm like, that's great. And all right. Like, you know what, like what, what about the rest of your life? Right. Cause I, I, I hope um, that, you know, that medicine isn't everything. Right. Because unfortunately it can be right. We, we've talked about it before. I've had um, a, a couple of guests, uh, about Dr. Aaron, as far as talking about burnout and everything else. And we, we, we understand like that plight when, you know, you allow medicine to be everything. So I love when I follow a physician's journey and I just see him doing random stuff like this it has nothing to do with medicine. They're just posting. Cause again, they are human. And I think a lot of, a lot of people sometimes forget like your doctor, even though it seems like the smartest person in the world, because you come in with a constellation of symptoms and they tell you what the actual answer is. Um, is a human as well, too. So I love being able to kind of see uh, both sides of the human and the doctor and educated and, and letting folks know, like, yes, I am like a de facto person to go to. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's um, people often forget that we are not just doctors, but we're patients ourselves sometimes. And we, you know, we also share the same sort of struggles the personal struggles that everyone else does and um we're just trying to you know do do a service out here i love it and so before i get you go i gotta ask like what is the association for healthcare social media right <laughs> like tell talk to like yeah like i said lunch learning community um again when i typically i'm looking out for gas and i i, I kind of think topic first right and then i just kind of see like oh who, who could fit this topic uh, and I think it literally just happened to be by chance. I had been following him for a while on uh, Instagram. And I'm like, oh, oh, I know he's a guest. Oh, okay. Let's, let's, let's see if he, so I slid in his DMs and he said, yes. So that's why he's here. Uh, but then when I go to do my homework, because again, I, I think it's important to, you know, inquire about your guests, right? Uh, like, again, this side, like, was like, kind of just kind of knocking me off my feet. Right. So talk, let's talk about this organization. Yeah. So the Association for Healthcare Social Media is the first nonprofit professional society devoted to helping health professionals use social media. And it's the first of its kind because really up until the past couple of years, you know, now we're seeing more health professionals actually be out there themselves. And, you know, this isn't talking about the, the communications or the marketing or PR people out there who are talking about health. This is those of us who are practicing medicine um, ourselves and being out there because we're in a very unique role as um, clinicians and health professionals to be talking about health online. And there are a lot of tricky things to, to do this both um, effectively as well as responsibly because there are a lot of ways this could go wrong. And the reason why this all came about actually was a group of us on Instagram over a year ago at this point actually saw that there were some people who were calling themselves doctors or physicians um, who either were not at all mm. or were um, trainees who were still you know, in school and not fully qualified or credentialed to be talking about some of the things that they were talking about or claiming to, to be physicians, I should say. You know, I think that obviously there's value to students and trainees talking about their journeys and talking about health, but sometimes... Um, if they portray themselves in a certain way, it could be misleading. And the whole issue is we want to try to, um, uh, that, that whole issue brought attention to uh, a lot of other problems with social media that still exist. And we're hoping that we can provide some guidance and define some of those gray areas a little bit better. Perfect. And so the, the, the goal really is to, again, kind of establish, like, not to say a criteria, but to say, like, hey, you know what, these are kind of, you know, some, some of the guidelines that you yeah, yeah, should yeah. do 
I love it. And again, I, again, I wish you guys would have been there, you know, again, when I was a medical student, right? Cause I can say, Hey, no, no, no. I'm, I'm like here. And, and lunch learning community, like I said, I, uh, because I was doing my research, like I will be a member uh, of this organization because again, I'm, I'm already doing it. Right. So there's really no reason, right. That I shouldn't be, you know, a part of an organization that's kind of, uh, really kind of, kind of, you know, calling out that siren, right. With that, I've been, I've been trying to call for years, right. Again, I tell all my friends, I got, unfortunately, what, I, what I've noticed, especially in, in, in our field, is we got a lot of smart people, right? But uh, a lot of them are smart kind of inside, right? Like they, they don't want to kind of boast out to the world like, hey, this is who I am. This is what I do on a daily basis. Um, it's, it's, this, it's this weird sense of humility that they have uh, for the general public that they don't seem to have when they're talking to us general. Like it's, just, it's a crazy thing. Um, yeah. You know that that our colleagues do, but that's okay. Uh, so I, I definitely uh, am excited, uh, you know, about a mission of an organization like this that's really trying to kind of you know standardize uh, the playing field and say like, no, no, no. If you have a health topic, health concern, these are the types of people you should be listening to. Not that blog that has you know thirty thousand you know readers, right? Like not that, right? Like a person like who you know calls himself a, a health coach, right? But like it's, again, like just. Yeah, we. I can go on for years. I won't do it. Right? I won't keep you on long because you know uh, I've been talking your head off, uh, you know, long enough. But again, I, w- I definitely want to uh, shout out that organization again. Um, the the Association for Healthcare Social Media, right? Again, is definitely something. And again, memory lunch and community members. All uh, this the link that I we mentioned uh, will be in the show notes, so you don't have to like worry about writing it down or anything. Everything will be in there uh, for your pleasure. Uh, before you go, right? Before you go, again, I probably said it a couple times. Before you go. Um, Give the people a chance to like kind of follow your journey. Like where can people find you, listen to you, subscribe, like all of that stuff there, right? This is this is the promo time frame before I get you out of here. <laughs> well, finding me is pretty easy. All of my, uh, all the social media platforms, the major social media platforms, I'm on pretty much all of them. So you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Um, I'm on Snapchat. I'm on Facebook. Um, and the most, my, my name pretty much is standard across all of the platforms. It's Austin Chang MD and, um, yeah, follow along my journey. Each, each platform is a little bit different. So you might see that some are a little more technical than others. Um, but you know, follow along and, um, and reach out to me whenever, if you have any questions, I am very accessible and always happy to answer questions. I love it. Again, uh, let and learn community members. Um, you got, uh, I really, it's almost like a two part episode, right? Where you got a chance <laughs> to talk about, uh, colon cancer. You got to learn about colon cancer, educate yourself about colon cancer. Remember this is colon cancer awareness month. If you have a relative who needs a colonoscopy, like let them know Dr. Austin and says like, stop with these excuses. Like the drink doesn't taste bad. The procedures, uh, you know, is less than that time that you're going to watch uh married to medicine or, um, you know, housewives yeah. or whatever that those shows like it's so it's so like let's stop this craziness. Get your colonoscopy uh t- today, next week, this month. Like get it done. My guys, we're no more excuses anymore. Of course, like always, go to your local uh, physician. You know, for all the expert advice and that way he can educate you. He or she can educate you on you know when you should be getting these procedures. But again, uh, no more running away uh from you know the, this 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 disease right that affects many. And it shouldn't be affecting as many people as it is, which is colon cancer. And then you also got to learn about social media, right? And again, and now you hear a second person. There's all there's a lot more people who do it, uh, but you hear you get to hear uh, another physician's position on you know why you should be out there, right? Like again, I I remember I wrote a blog that said um um uh, a true life. My doctor isn't on social media, like because again it, I was because it was it's just shocking to me that we don't like we're not running. Uh, to the hills to try to get on social media. So again, Dr. Austin, thank you so much uh, for such an amazing episode. Like I said, I'm I'm excited to learn and I'm I'm excited to kind of follow your journey uh, as well as like I said, I'm gonna I'm gonna become a member uh, of this organization because again, I'm I'm in the thick of things and I want I want to help that membership grow as well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I really appreciate it and um and I can't. I, this is so exciting to be on your show and um hopefully we can you know, keep putting the good word out there on social media. Thank you for getting to the end of the show. I am your host, Dr. Barry Pierre, host of the Lunch Learner, Dr. Barry. And this is another amazing episode that we like to bring to you week after week on 
betterment of empowering yourself for better health today. If you have not had a chance, please go ahead and subscribe to the show if this is your first time listening. If you already listen and you've already subscribed, make sure to leave me a five star review because your support is absolutely important in keeping the show moving as it is. And if you have not had a chance and you want to check out today's show notes, always head over to lunchlearnpod.com. That is lunch learn pod all in one word dot com and you can get the access to my show notes for every single episode but separately especially the one you just listened to and i'm gonna see you guys next week you guys be blessed bye